uh, Doug and Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and we're ready to hear what you have for us. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to, to have everyone sign on. Thanks for your uh, interest in our presentation. We wanted to start out by trying to convince you that we need better math in our society if you're not already convinced. If we can see advertisements like this get 50% off or half price, whichever is less, we're pretty much in trouble in our society. If that brings them into the stores, I'm not sure what to say about our mathematical competence. We don't do much with uh, statistics as statistics in early childhood, but it also scares me to see a newspaper article which declares this, that statistics show that teen pregnancy drops off significantly after age 25. I can see why that would happen. <laughs> Once they're out of the teen years like that, that's, that's what you're going to get. So we're going to talk today about how to improve this rather sad state of affairs. Because early math, early math is particularly important for developing later math competence. Large-scale research from Greg Duncan and his colleagues, uh, which you see in this graph, shows that early reading predicts later school success, but m early mathematics predicts later math success and general school success and even later reading better than early literacy skills do, better than attention, externalizing, social skills, and the like. Early mathematics is really fundamental. And not only that, but um, the preschoolers have a lot of confidence that sometimes surprises us. Uh, in, this, in this slide, you can see um, Corey is putting together four triangles to make squares in a puzzle. So there is a frame, and uh, there are triangular prism blocks. And Corey has put four of them together the correct way to sort of fill in that frame. Uh, when he's done, uh, not of what he's a square structure, but he, and he recognizes, okay, we're putting triangles together to make a square. And he forms a square of two triangles, but this one won't fit. It's not, it's not large enough. So Corey um, finishes it, and he shows an adult. And the adult, and this is really important because this is where the adult comes into play, and it's just giving, giving Corey the puzzle and the activity wouldn't be enough to really make this mathematics. And, and the adult says, how many triangles did you use? And Corey counts them individually. And uh, Corey's a, a, a really bright boy. He's able to count to 24 easily. And he says, 24. And she says, 24 what? Now, that's interesting, because when you see the puzzle completed, there's more than one thing to count there. And Corey says correctly, triangles. And then the teacher says, how many squares do you have? And Corey puts four fingers on each of the triangles in the new unit and counts each square and says six. Now, why is that so powerful? Because Corey made a new unit of four triangles to make a new unit that's one square. And if you think about our base 10 system, when we ask kids to say, OK, we have, um, I have 100. How many, ones, how many ones are there? 100. How many tens are there? 10. Being able to flexibly think in those units is very important for his later knowledge of math. And this later knowledge has got to grow better. Again, uh, we see these kind of comparisons all the time. Notice we've circled the United States in this particular international comparison where many other countries do better than we do. But there's a second part to that story as well. Different kids from different socioeconomic status levels in our society perform very differently. So that's the United States on the average. But take a look at this. Where do the kids who are best funded in the United States, on whom we spend the most money on their mathematics education, fall? Second in the world, actually. And how about the kids at the other end of the spectrum, the kids on whom we spend the least on their mathematics education? They score just above Nigeria and Swaziland. So there's two stories here. Internationally, we don't do very well, and we have to improve mathematics education pre-K and up. But also, we've got to pay special attention, 
starting with the preschool years and going right through the early childhood years with those children who come less advantaged than others in terms of their economic status, in terms of their opportunities to learn mathematics. That's why prevention and intervention are both so important. The kids at the bottom frequently fill the tier two and tier three levels. Prevention and intervention are really important for kids. That's the whole notion of response to intervention. What does it need? What does it need to have good response to intervention? We need high quality standards. We need trajectories where we understand the movement of kids along a path of learning mathematics. And we need instruction that moves all students along those paths. And finally, we need assessments that connect all of these. So we're going to be talking a little bit about each of those. But the basic lesson, again, from these international comparisons for standards, is less is more. We need sustained time on fewer key concepts. That's what we tried to do when we uh, developed the curriculum focal points. Now, curriculum focal points was written before the Common Core State Standards, and actually it was the basis for a lot of the early childhood uh, and elementary standards. Um, and I'd like to emphasize just a few things about when we wrote the curriculum focal points. First of all, it does have a pre-K level. I'm not going to leave this on the screen uh, long enough for anybody to really get much content out of it, but it's available at nctm.org. And it's important because the Common Core, as you probably well know, does not have a pre-K level. But because the two are um, co coordinated and sympathetic with each other in a way, that this constitutes a very good list of the most important concepts and skills for preschoolers to, to learn. I'd like to point out one other thing before I move to the Common Core about the grade two, because I think it's a statement we sometimes fail to see. I'm going to take it out of that second curriculum focal point, the number and operations in algebra strand. I'm circling it here, but I'll blow that up so people can read it. Children develop, discuss, and use efficient, accurate, and generalizable methods to add and subtract multi-digit whole numbers. They develop fluency with efficient procedures, including standard algorithms, but not limited to them. For adding and subtracting whole numbers, understand why the procedures work on the basis of place value and property of operations and use them to solve problems. What's important to us particularly about all this, it's all important. But notice the first phrase, children develop, discuss, and use. That means that the curriculum focal points made a strong statement saying we want them to develop the standard algorithms, but we want them to understand arithmetic first. Single digit, multi-digit, we want them to develop their own methods for solving it, discuss those methods, and use those methods. Moving to the Common Core then, the Common Core state standards built upon the curriculum focal points and also in early childhood uh, report that came from the National Research Council that I was also honored to help author. And what you often miss is how close the curriculum focal points and the, and the Common Core State Standards are. They align very nicely. Another thing you might miss is this is, comes from the first page of the second grade Common Core. You'll find it very familiar. It sounds exactly like, intentionally, the curriculum focal points. Children develop, discuss, and use efficient, accurate, and generalizable methods to compute sums and differences of whole numbers. Once again, the Common Core is saying, let kids invent, discuss, figure out, struggle through, and solve problems of arithmetic before we have them compute with standard algorithms. And I, and I think that uh, there's some always some uh, misunderstanding around um, those words, you know, what it develop, you're going to develop your own algorithm, you know, especially if we're talking about kids for whom an intervention might be appropriate. Um, you know, these, in, these algorithms were developed by mathematicians years and years ago. How are they going to develop their own, own algorithms? And I think that uh, people need to understand that what they mean by that is that um, students actually, without much formal instruction, this is how you add three and this is how you add five will, with very little instruction, will say, oh, I got five because then five and three more, five, six, seven, eight, or even one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we'll take that understanding and start using it with bigger numbers and come up with ways. 
they might not be the most efficient method. They might not necessarily be the most accurate method. But that's where at first. At first. That's why that's where a teacher comes in, a knowledgeable adult. Will that only work? Is this the best way? How did you do it? Oh, I added this first. And that's that's the type of thing because I think now um, you know, things are going around on the internet and saying, uh, oh no, why can't we just do it do it the good old way? And no one's not no one is ever saying that efficient algorithms are important. We're saying that students struggling and making sense of the numbers is important both in a set in the Common Core and it's set in curriculum focal points. And this has been part of what researchers have been telling us. Uh, what we found in our own research is important for um, going back to John Dewey. Another thing that could be missed about the Common Core is that learning trajectories, they're at the core of the Common Core. Actually, when we developed the Common Core mathematics, we developed learning trajectories, or at least part of learning trajectories, that core part that talks about the levels of thinking through which kids pass on their way to achieving a certain mathematical goal. We wrote those first, and then those were cut apart uh, by the main writers, Bill McCallum, Phil Darrow, um, and Jason, um, uh, were cut apart into the various grade levels. But they were always part of a coherent story of learning mathematics. So learning trajectories. Our idea of learning trajectories are they have three parts, a goal, a developmental progression of those levels of thinking and instructional activities. Because there's been work on mathematics, and that's contributed. The red line shows it's contributed to standards. There's been research on developmental progressions that have contributed to assessments, and also on instructional tasks that have contributed to curriculum and teaching. But Julie and I think a scientific approach to learning trajectories weaves those three parts together so that standards, curriculum, and assessment all come from a common shared research base. So let's take a quick look at a learning trajectory for counting. We first established the goals. And the goals, in the number goal there, numbers can be used to tell how many describe, order, and measure, and involve various relationships. And can be represented in various ways on the upper left there. That's our goal for counting. Then there are levels of thinking for counting. So for instance, pre-counter kids say numbers but not in sequence, you know, 1, 2, 4, 17, 2, 6. Or they might say, they might say random words. I, I mean, we, I heard it with uh, children who, who have, uh, I was working in a preschool just the other day, and um, yellow was a pretty common <laughs> answer for how many there are. <laughs> Okay. Then when they get to be chanters, they can say them in sequence, but they may run them together a little bit. This is like the Eliminati or Sweet Land of Liberty kids. Um, and then finally, they can be good verbal counters. They separate the number words. They use the number words. They tell them in order. That's good. That's verbal counting. But it, of course, all you out there who teach young kids know it doesn't start stop there. We have to have kids count correctly using one-to-one -one correspondence for at least up to five objects in a line. So if you see child one here, uh, can, can, can point one, two, three, four, five. So can child two. So, so the top row there illustrates both of those kids are at least at the corresponder level. But the next level then, child one might say, so how many blocks are there? And child one again points to the block and says one, two, three, four, five. Or, I don't know. Uh, or another number. You know, again, teachers in the classroom. Sometimes six, that. for example. Right, yeah. right. So, um, so, okay, is this three? I don't know. Well, let's count and find out. One, two, three. How many are there? Eight, you know. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Whereas child two has what, what uh, we call the cardinality principle, or more simply, the how many this idea. The child understands that the last counting word at the cessation of counting has a special function. It tells you how many there are all together. And yet, learning trajectory doesn't start with that counter small number. So it doesn't stop with the counter small number level either. It continues to grow where kids can produce a set up to five, which is harder because you've got to keep the goal in mind and stop at the right time. They learn to count collections up to 10. They learn to count 
unorganized collections. Up to now, we've always kept those collections in a nice straight line for kids that helps them keep spatially oriented and count beyond 10. And then eventually, they can count beyond 10. They can count on, like Julie was saying. What was your example, Julie? The child of 24. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the five, six, seven, eight, the child who could just start with five and count up uh, to, to add those two numbers with counting. So that's just a little part of our developmental progression. And we wish we could show you a video of these kind of things. Um, but there are resources for that kind of thing and to watch these things in action on kids, which is so valuable to teachers. But we'd like to move on to the third part of the learning trajectory, which is the instructional activities. So for instance, in counting, uh, we might do finger plays. And we looked long and hard for finger plays because you guys know in early childhood so many of them, five little monkeys and the like, go backwards. So we worked and wrote some and developed some uh, that are, but the, the songs to sing, um, whether they're songs or finger plays or games like Hoover or something like that where you stomp around the classroom counting, uh, we want to do a lot of that kind of verbal counting. But then quickly move to things like how many times can you, um, uh, toss a, a, an object in the air and catch it without dropping it. So the kids now are, are concentrating on the one-to-one -one correspondence. Here's another computer activity that teaches one-to-one -one correspondence. In this activity, uh, every time the child moves the mouse over the, um, the popsicle, um, a bite gets taken out of it. And so, so not when they move it, when they click. So it, what it does is you click on the first one, it says one. You click on the second one, it says two. You click on the third one, it says three. So what it's building up is a correspondence between the number word, the, the audio, and the click, the action. And so it, it starts building that up to the child. So a child who will count one, two, three, four, five while pointing at objects rather slowly and is unable to keep that one-to-one -one correspondence, this really slows it up and enforces the one-to-one -one correspondence. And then we move on to the counter small numbers where they learn the cardinality idea. So here's just one example. Kids don't play enough uh, card and board games. So in this example, the dots at the bottom come up kind of like you would roll a die. They just come up in that linear fashion. And then the child has to move that many. So once again, they have to understand the quantity of two. Understand that counting one, two gives you two dots. Transfer that count quantity to movement along here, and then um, move the, uh, their, count, their um, icon to two dots, and they keep playing this kind of race game. This is a computer screen because it's easy to show you, but of course we always have kids play hands-on on a large board on the ground with real dice and moving these things. One thing I'd note is that the program Number Worlds, which is an intervention program for mathematics, uh, K through eight. Um, the reason, one of the reasons it's called Number Worlds, because the idea is kids need to see number in a variety of situations. Note here how important it is that they see number as a set of dots and then connect it to number as seen as two movements and two dis, you know, the distance of two along the path. So there's a pre-measurement understanding, there's an inactive movement understanding, and there's a dots pattern, all of which are linked for kids by these kind of games. Julie and I don't stop there. We don't want it to always be dots. So uh, one another level is uh, a shape randomly comes up. And in order to know how much you have to move, you have to count the size. Again, that comes from our research and understanding that uh, children don't really uh, separate uh, the parts of a shape, um, and when you ask them even how many sides, we don't know necessarily what they're pointing at, what they're really counting. Uh, so this, this side will highlight uh, when, when the computer helps the child to sort of reinforce, this is what a side, side is, and this is how we count sides of the shape. And another world of number, the geometric representation of the number is thus presented. Listen, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to keep going here for sure. Julie and I are keep going, but one thing we wanted to uh, tell people is please use the uh, um, panel there to ask us any questions 
while we're presenting. We don't want you to have to wait to the end. If you have a good question, we're happy to interrupt ourselves and take that question when you ask it. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's look then. Counting a number should not stop with simple counting, even simple counting of objects with cardinality. We need to do more with number. For instance, number is great for comparing things. Which is more, which is less. Kids aren't necessarily good at that. So in our next game, what kids do is pick the number that they're going to move. Uh, which is better, one or three? Well, usually the bigger number. And of course, they get a lot of practice in these games choosing, in this case, the bigger number. But if you know that the blue spaces that are marked are forward action spaces, this time, in this situation, when your uh, spaceship is right there, you want to click on the one because you know then you'll go five more. So we always want the kids thinking. Comparing numbers, yes, but always thinking strategically. And then we move through an arithmetic sheet sequence even with some preschool kids, but the software goes right up through the primary grades, where all kids have to do here is the basic idea of addition, combining two groups, right, uh, and move that many. Uh, and then we, we encourage them to eventually add numerals, too, so they have to become uh, more able to take that more symbolic representation. Sure, they can work it out on their fingers. That's great. Um, and then, finally, uh, pretend you're in uh, first or second grade now. You might play, be playing the addition choice game where, once again, now you have to choose two numbers, add those together, and move that many. Again, choosing the largest two numbers and adding those is usually going to be your best strategy. You'll watch out that you don't land on a backwards red action space. And uh, be careful that maybe a different combination of numbers will get you on a blue forward action space. So it behooves you to add several pairs of numbers together and compare where they'll where you'll end up and and what that will uh, what are the ramifications for you in terms of winning the game. I'm going to move on off that to an area of geometry and measurement. So just take a moment right now and think which of these are rectangles. Uh, I do this um, this slide with teachers um, all over the country and fairly frequently, and so I just did it two Saturdays ago. So I can kind of go through and say what happened there. And um, uh, number one is uh, is most people say no. Number two is the first one that we get tripped up about. Because number two, most people say no, it's not a rectangle, and I hear why not? It's either a square or a diamond. I'm just going to say number two is a rectangle and, and just hold on right there. Number three, some people will say, is a rectangle. Because why? It has two long sides and two short sides. So therefore, um, it fits the definition. And in fact, if you look at most, um, most songs, poems, worksheets, the definition for rectangle that teachers are told to provide for kids is two long sides, two short sides. And what we know, mathematically, is that's not what a rectangle means. A rectangle, if you think of the name, right angle, is any shape, any quadrilateral, with four right angles. So number two is a rectangle, and number three is not a rectangle. And just hold on a second. If two long sides and two short sides, isn't that still a good definition? Well, not only is number three not a rectangle and fits that definition, look at number four. No, number four has two long sides and two short sides. It's definitely not a rectangle. Again, the teachers a couple Saturdays ago said, yeah, but we mean two long sides on either side and two short sides on either side. And again, that doesn't help with number six, and it doesn't help with number two or number seven, both of which are rectangles because they have four right angles. So what do we tell kids? We tell kids a rectangle is a four-sided shape. Does it have four sides? Yes, it does. And does it have right angles? Yes, it does. Some teachers are not comfortable with right angles. They can say right corners, square corners, rectangle corners. Any of those types of things work. We really need children to focus on corners. So what we know is that children have struggled with this when we get a study. They did slightly better than 50%. We know four-year-olds were actually more likely to accept squares as rectangles, and we're told by the teachers they were wrong. 
and um, most students accepted on um, like ones like number three and number six as as rectangles, even though they weren't. Um, and very very little progress happens in children's under understanding of rectangles from the age of four to twelve, so from pre-K through grade six. Very little gains in, in our scores. So they start out knowing something, even if they're not perfect, mm -hmm. and they don't learn very much they in don't, school. They don't learn very much in school at all. So when we talk about teaching geometry, um, we know that we have to move away from, from things like this. And this is something that our son brought home uh, years ago, and um, which case a uh, triangle with the bowl shape, and children were asked to uh, circle, ring the triangle, which is better than circle. And as you can see, the triangle on top is actually not a bad triangle. The base is not horizontal, so it gives the kids a different visual prototype. But look at the one that the, uh, that the textbook um, has, has, has dotted around as the right answer. There aren't straight sides, there aren't, so there aren't three straight sides, and it has a hook. And if you look at most of the things that Ryan C. has, uh, has, has drawn a ring around, um, there's problems with all of them. Um, if you look at the sailboat, let's focus on the sailboat. That actually has one, two, three, four, five sides. It's a pentagon. Now, sure, Ryan might be thinking, and you might might have been thinking, and you might be thinking, yeah, but it has triangle sails. Yes, that's true. And but that's something to talk about. That's why these kinds of activities really aren't helpful. The kind of thing that would be helpful is say, say we had a sandwich, and Ryan brought a sandwich in and said, look, my sandwich is cut in triangles. It would be nice for the teacher to say, well, I can see that there's three, but are the sides straight? No, you know. I think Ryan would have said no. It's okay. So it's no, almost a triangle, but not really. How can we make it a triangle? And if there, there, um, you know, most children, I think, are, are like finding sort of the mistakes in life and thinking about how they would fix them. So this paper, as it is, not so good. If you have materials like that, the kind of ideas for that Julie is presenting for fixing those makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yes. Um, so let's, let's talk about, we talked about learning trajectories and number. Let's think about what, do we have learning trajectories in geometry? Yes, we do. We have it for several con areas in, in, in geometry. But let's look at just composing <laughs> so, the video. So in, um, in, if you're, if, if uh, a child is learning how to put shapes together and take them apart, um, they are like, making a puzzle. Um, one thing that we know is children at the lowest level will just put pieces on a puzzle without really thinking how they go together or not in any case. Um, and uh, at, a, at, a, at a higher level, children will be able to fill in the puzzle, but it's mostly trial and error, and they're not really attending to the angles as much as they're just looking at sides and sides that line up. At, a, uh, at the highest level, a child will use intentionality and will think ahead of time, huh, does this go? Do, I'm, I, she looks. She looks over and she chooses the shape, and she actually changes it in the air. There's very little trial and error. The work is being done uh, internally in her mind. Mental images. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we're trying to say is it's important to consider all three components of a learning trajectory. What is the mathematics? How do kids learn that mathematics? And then how do you instruct that? So in our building block software, for instance, Julie, what level would this be for? Okay, so this is a very, very early, this is, would be for kids at the lowest level. And so um, the children don't really have to fill in an object, they're just really matching shapes. But in the process of matching shapes, they're starting to make things and put them together. At the next level, uh, there's some more, a more of a connection between the shapes, but every time you put a shape in, it sort of gives you a big clue over what comes next. So it's almost like it's matching shapes, but not quite. You go ahead. And, and then we, we, at the middle level, that girl who's in the middle, she might get something like this, the bottom two shapes are pretty obvious, right? But again, there's a little ambiguity in the top level there. And that third girl, um, she would get a, a, a puzzle like this, both off computer and on computer, again, that's important to keep in mind, in which she really has got to look at the angles of these shapes. And, and then we'd move her to puzzles like this that, yeah, 
Yeah, I bet you think, wait, that seems easier. Yes, it is. But you have to know, when she finishes this puzzle, the computer will tell her, good job, takes off the shape and says, now solve it again, but you can't use the same shapes. And all of it, we let them free explore. I think it's in, you know, Doug and I and our philosophy is that not every activity should be completely closed. To, you know, there's not a, there's not always one right, but like an exact example, even when we give it an activity that has sort of an answer, there's more than one way to get that answer. I'll be thinking back to the common core and, and the um, curriculum focal points, just like with number. So with geometry, there's more than one way to solve a puzzle, but in this case, we also want kids to be able to create their own pictures with shapes. So in this activity, um, kids can create a puzzle and then have their friends solve it. So this is our Building Box curriculum. And we just wanted to mention uh, that this is a preschool curriculum research-based for prevention. Um, what, what, I'm going to go through these slides really quickly because the basic point is it's how those learning trajectories. There's the big ideas. That's the mathematics, right? That's the goal. Then we talk about the developmental progression, those levels of thinking. Every chapter, every week uh, starts with a reminder to teachers of the levels of thinking within, in this case, verbal counting, object counting, and subitizing, quick recognition of small groups. So the teacher gets that in mind. And then it's integrated into the day, and the complete learning trajectories are provided to the teachers so they can tie together kids' levels of thinking and the specific activities. So they know where their class is as a whole, but they also know where the individuals are as they work through these activities. Um, the daily plans then do whole group and return at the end of the week back to the learning trajectories for assessment and individualization so that every kid uh, experiences the kind of formative assessment that we know. And our research shows that although um, in these uh, 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 districts that have been doing a lot with early math, the control group learned a lot, the, the group that did building blocks uh, which we nicknamed Triad because that's our scale-up model for these studies, outperformed that group nicely. Um, interestingly, too, some groups benefit especially well. This is a little hard to follow, but here are pre-post preschool, uh, pre-K scores for the control kids who are not African American, those that fell in other groups, identified with other groups. Here are the control African American kids learning less in the control classrooms, business as usual. Here are the building blocks kids who are non-African American, and here are the building blocks kids who were African American. Do you notice that in those last two, the African American kids are closing the gap? And in the business as usual classrooms, the control classrooms, it's widening. This is something we have to attend to. Learning trajectories help teachers change their image of how much different groups of kids can learn. We also benefited because they did better in literacy and language. So uh, just when we, when we start doing a math intervention with, with uh, preschool teachers, a big thing that happens is that teachers get nervous about um, literacy and ignoring literacy since a big part of the pre-K day um, is literacy based. So uh, one thing we just wanted always to talk to teachers about was even it's not how much time you spent in math, although that definitely matters. It's understanding how kids learn math, learning trajectories, and um, being able to differentiate instruction, also part of learning trajectories, and uh, um, being very intentional about, about what math you're doing and following it in the sequence, all part of learning trajectories. We don't ignore, it's not necessary to ignore literacy. So what happened is after the summer, we tested the kids in some literacy uh, measures just to see how they do, and in fact, uh, they uh, there was no significant difference on kids' letter recognition um, and uh, 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 sentence length, um, listening, or story duration when they were retelling the story. However, uh, the kids in the math intervention actually did better um, on getting more information from the story, using more complex sentences, and being able to tell the story independently. And again, we attributed this to the fact that uh, Building Blocks is a language-intensive program, meaning that, oh, and being also able to ask, answer inferential questions. What do you think will happen? What do you think? Why do you think the bus did this? 
Um, so when, when, when I'm doing building blocks activities in the classroom, and I, and I still do, as I said, I was in a preschool just yesterday uh, working with some kids that the teacher was worried she had identified as April and she felt they, didn't, they weren't um, even keeping one-to-one -one correspondence. So I went in to work with the teacher and to talk to the kids. And uh, yeah, there was a large mix of kids within that classroom. But, um, you know, right away, the thing is, how do you know? And I'm asking how do you know all the time because I'm trying to gather information of where the kids are. I mean, that's part of, that's part of an intervention. That's part of, um, that's part of trying to figure out where kids are on learning trajectories. And so kids are answering those questions. So it definitely becomes a lot more language. So um, we have only uh, three minutes left. Yeah, to our allotted time, and then we'd love to, to take more questions. I see that a couple questions had come in, and I put off the one of them who asked, uh, Julie asked a long time ago, because we were getting to the slide, Julie. Um, FRA Number Worlds is, a, is an intervention program, like I said before, that also works along learning trajectories. So that, for instance, notice that in Level C, Week 24, they focus on numbers to 100 and moving through the number sequence where Lesson 1 reviews subtraction in preparation for work with greater numbers. Um, and you see this kind of learning trajectory emphasis laid out uh, throughout the structure of the number worlds. And remember, number worlds was the one that I talked about that does a lot with games because they connect the different worlds of numbers. Here's the number line to 100 game, very similar to the, uh, to the building blocks activity. And indeed, the building blocks software is integrated into number worlds. Don't confuse that with the building blocks pre-K program, which, which is a prevention program that has its own teacher's guide, assessment book, uh, materials kits, and the software as well. Um, and then it, it, Number Worlds goes, goes on, and Lesson 3 goes into an elevator game, and then you repeat the number line to 100 game. Uh, you play off the tree in the building block software, and you have guided practice to move along a path. So again, to, get, to review what we said, response to intervention for these kids, what does it need? It needs high-quality standards. We talked about that. Trajectories for students' learning, which includes instruction that moves all kids along. And then you also need assessments that connect all these. So in just a minute, Julie's going to give you a whirlwind tour of our team tool. OK. So the team tool is, is indeed uh, it's a math assessment for children in pre-K through grade 2. Uh, there is a, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's an assessment where the questions are really um, in context, which is, which is nice because it's not just typically um, straight ahead what we would call some growing up math questions. They might be questions that are really, especially for the younger kids, intended to tap into their informal math knowledge and still learn what they want. Um, so we, we uh, the teachers, it's a one-on-one it's a, it's a -on -one interview that's intended to be given by an adult. As you can see here, it uh, comes up on the screen. There are materials, and you can see the assessment, the context in this case is a grocery store, and that child has bananas in a grocery cart. Um, and uh, so you can test on an iPad, uh, any smartphone on the web, or you can just use paper and pencil scoring sheet. Um, after you score it, you are able to get a report of the child that can tell you about where they are in terms of on grade level. It can tell you the developmental progressions mastered. Um, and it really, you know, we're trying to get people to look beyond just the percentage score, but say, okay, um, a 60% might seem very low on object counting effect. It is on object counting for a child who's that age. Um, but it says they missed two questions, so it allow the teacher to be able to dig and drill in and say, OK, I'll remember those two questions. It's not a big deal. Um, so there still gives the teacher the power to understand everything. Uh, then um, it does indeed uh, say what we suggest would help the child move to the next level based on that report. So product within building blocks um, online or number worlds or, or something. And so um, I'll, not only building blocks and number worlds, but it's also linked to these other common um, uh, curricula that are out there. So because we know from the National Math Panel report that formative assessment, understanding where kids are, and using it to modify instruction enhances mathematics achievement, but that only works when 
information is used to determine the and change instruction and when experts offer advice. The team does this. By presenting learning trajectories and links with the learning trajectories, we achieve that. So to conclude, and then we'll take some questions, children can learn a lot of math, but the gaps are striking. Less is more, so we need to concentrate on fewer key concepts. We need to use prevention and intervention. Together, the implications for prevention, as well as the Building Blocks Pre-K program, uh, are strong. But for intervention as well, when kids go up through the grades and struggle, and we illustrated that with the Number Worlds with Building Blocks program. Uh, we talked about uh, closing those gaps, using research-based education like we're talking about today, doing good geometry rather than bad geometry, having kids moving. And finally, I just want to return to my favorite example of why we need to do this, to remind you of the way we started. Here's a sign from a town. It tells you interesting mathematical facts, like the population is 562. It's 2,150 feet above sea level. It was established in 1951, but what you all were dying to know is the total of those is 4,663. We really need better mathematics in our society. I'm hoping that the kind of intervention and prevention that we talked about today will help you uh, provide better mathematics for the children you're working with. How about a couple questions there, Julie? I see we got a couple. One from Julie that I ignored, another Julie, that I ignored um, was, is Number Worlds online? Yes, the software is. Um, and several tools are online, too, uh, helpful tools, assessment tools, and the like. But the program is still a book program, too. Uh, you get a teacher's edition and materials kits. And to go back to my our building blocks pre-K uh, program, again, that also contains a teacher's edition, an assessment book, a resource book, and a huge kit of materials for pre-K. Right. And in terms of, did we collect data on the success with other ethnic backgrounds? The actual population that we worked with in all our studies, uh, we were in Boston, uh, Boston, Buffalo, Nashville, San Diego, and now we're in New York City. Uh, we have data on all, all kinds of kids. I think specifically when you were talking about, um, about uh, the African American versus non-African American, it's the, kind of, it's, 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 the, it's the kind of thing that showed, particularly for that population and that particular study, uh, the fact that those kids had been scoring lower and in the control group had actually dropped off a little bit and that, that it wasn't the case and that they had done much better. So um, it was really about closing the gap for one particular group that typically is underserved. But in fact, uh, if you take all the kids and you put them all together, the children using building blocks uh, experienced greater growth than the kids who did not experience it. In, in, in every uh, uh, ethnic, ethnic group and, 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 the, and the like. And, um, and socioeconomic status. We and socioeconomic right. status. So, um, and then uh, can the team assessment be used with four-year-olds? Yes. The yes. team can be used with four-year-olds. We use it's it with four-year-olds. Uh, you know, uh, we've used it with threes through second graders. Right. In fact, in a couple of the studies, the cutoff for um, official pre-K is December 31st. Which means oh, oh this person asked because it, she only noticed kindergarten on the form, sure, because that was just a few examples. Right. 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 But indeed, uh, yeah, we've, we've used it with young threes. They don't get very far. It's not young threes. Older threes. So they're going to <laughs> right, right, right. They, they don't get very far, and there's a stop rule so that you don't have to ask them lots and lots of questions that they're not going to understand. After they get three or four in a row wrong, they can, you can stop giving the assessment. And because they're ordered by difficulty, you can kind of assume that's about as far as they're going to go. So it becomes more age appropriate. Uh, also, if you gave it to a second grader, there's a start rule, and, right. and you you know you establish that kind of basic. Basic. Any any other questions for uh, Julie and me? Oh yeah, there's two more from Sarah. Is the Number World assessment aligned with the CTB acuity assessment system? Um, actually, we don't know. Uh, we uh, we worked on we worked on uh, the team assessment, and we did not work on the CTB. Acuity assessment. So, I, so I throw that question back to our um, McGraw Hill, uh, McGraw Hill education colleagues, and we'll see if they have a response for us. But is there another question oh, while Sarah? they're thinking? Sure. Uh, Sarah also asked if it was aligned with the Minnesota State standards, which are different from the Common Core standards. 
Yes. Yes. I, the I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, the less is more idea means that it's typically more aligned with, with most state standards, we're, we're aligned with most state standards before Common Core. So um, the number of world's intervention and the building blocks intervention and the team, and the team all. predated the Common Core, and we're aligned with the uh, NCTM curriculum focal points. And so but the new additions then have been realigned. Have been realigned, but in fact, um, if you look at your state standards, I don't think that you're going to see um, much difficulty, especially with those ages. Anything else? And are there modifications for special needs students? Oh, that's honest? such a good question. Um, you thought you want to answer it? Yeah, well, I'll start with the building blocks um, modification. Uh, the the um, uh, the number world has its own set of things because it's an intervention program. It's especially uh, attuned to that because building blocks, our pre-K program, is a prevention program. Um, uh, you know, the, the basic idea is this is for kids to make sure all kids learn. And so, so we have challenging materials in there for kids because even, uh, you know, a child can come from a, a certain uh, ethnic group, which is often uh, not well served by uh, schools, um, and can be from a low research community, and can still be gifted and talented in mathematics. So we want to make sure that uh, we address all these kinds of possibilities, just because a kid's from a low research group. We've had kids who have had three years of developmental growth in the pre-K year alone, uh, working with building blocks. But anyway, um, the resources and the modifications, what we do is we provide, um, if a child is struggling, here are some suggestions how to, in real time, when you're working with them in a small group, modify that activity for children who are struggling. If the child is excelling, we want to give that kid a challenge. So here are some ideas. That's built into the weekly activities. But in addition, there's a whole other book for kids who are English language learners that gives you cognates and other kinds of resources for English language learners. And then an appendix in the building blocks that builds in um, other suggestions that was actually written by us in collaboration with experts in, in uh, 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 treat, uh, uh, serving children with special needs so that you'll have things that go a wide variety of mathematical difficulties and disabilities uh, plus uh, a sensory adaptations for kids who are um, difficulty seeing, difficulty hearing. Uh, those modifications for every activity are in the back of the book in the appendices. So um, Alina writes, do you think the Number Worlds program works well as a Title I math material, or is it better as a classroom? Oh, that's a good question program? as well. Um, I think that uh, Number Worlds program is a Title I math material. However, um, the approach, the basic approach in learning trajectories, so the power behind that approach, is that if um, it allows you to modify the activities for kids along a developmental continuum. So again, uh, working with the classroom where I have some children who are at grade level, um, it's not a problem. I can, I can use the activity as is. However, it allows me to quickly modify the, those, those activities for children who are below grade level. And in fact, because they're easy to modify, I can scan sort of down the page to where a higher level of thinking is and modify the modify the activity to make it um, even appropriate for kids who are uh, exceptional at the other end. So um, the, the difficulty in it being um, more or less a, a, a whole classroom program is in the fact that it does include, uh, I think it's important to include, small group activities. So if, if it's just like whole group and then kids work on sheets, it's not that. Uh, there are activities that are expected that the teacher is expected to really be able to modify. So there has to be this idea that the teacher is always gathering data. They're always asking kids, how do you know, and trying to figure out where kids are in learning trajectories to be able to modify the program. I think it's completely appropriate for a classroom that's targeting regular kids, but it also serves the needs of Title I children because it is, um, it is modified for kids who are, who are struggling to meet grade level expectations. Yeah, we've tried to develop it so it can serve both those things. I think it is important to say that 
it's not intended to be used constantly for a replacement for a, a series as much as it is to be used whether in transition, whether in a small group, whether in a Title I um, either pull-out program, and I use pull-out in quotes because I'd much rather they're in the regular classroom and receive extra um, uh, help and support and, and education through the Number Worlds program. But eventually those kids, the idea is not to do every Number Worlds activity, but to find those that a group of kids, a small group of kids, or even an individual kid needs, to get them back into the regular curriculum. We want to close that gap when we can. Now, there's certain kids who are uh, have true mathematical difficulties who will always be doing a subset of, of the goals, achieving a subset of the goals. So we have to find the core goals for them. But with response to intervention, the vast majority of kids given excellent instruction. There's nothing wrong with that child's thinking or learning only in the experiences that the child has not had. So the Number Wolf program and the, uh, is, is trying to catch that kid up um, uh, to, to the com kind of common core expectations. What else do you have? Julie, I see that, another question. Uh, that was just Heidi now. asking about the slides, and I think our moderator can answer that, answer that question, whether they're going to be available or will this be offered again. And I think that, oh, I don't know, yeah, more coming. There's yes, that's correct. Julie, welcome. that's correct. We are recording, and this will be sent out in a follow-up email to everybody. So we will we will get that to everyone. Good. And then Elizabeth asked, how can a district pilot this program with a few students? What would the cost be of trying a program? Again, Doug and I are authors, and we're not uh, we're not in that aspect of things. And uh, the team tools. So 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 time. Julie, they would be wanting to address that either now or. Um, through the McGraw-Hill Education website, their local rep would be able to help them answer those questions. Uh, the, the building blocks technology should be, be able to work on the iPad right now it, in the browser. In the browser. It should be able to work in a browser on the iPad. Not yeah. as an app, but on the browser. Right, browser. right, right. Through a, uh, we're actually uh, working on doing even more um, reprogramming to be more accessible. Right now, it would be through a browser on, on those kind of technologies. OK, thank you very much. I think we're out of time, so we'll turn it back to, to our hosts here. And thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Doug and Julie. Um, we appreciate, again, your time today. Um, I, as I said just a minute ago, uh, we are going to be sending a follow-up email out to everyone, a link to the recording. Um, and as you exit the webinar today, we have a survey that's going to open, um, and we'd really appreciate your feedback and, and to help us improve and plan future webinars. Um, if we did not get to your question today, um, we've got it all logged, and we will uh, address any of those we did not get to. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining us, and thanks again, uh, Dr. Julie. You're welcome. Take care.